hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for letting me share my study. I'm really excited to share it. I've absolutely loved um, doing it and also it's a really nice environment and place to do this. I've got my director of studies, the wonderful Karen, and also my external examiner as well, uh, Jim. Uh, so it's lovely to uh, be here with my colleagues and, and friends too. Um, I also want to say I'm it's, it's exciting but also feel very vulnerable as well because it's been such a big part of my life for so long um, and also recently unfortunately been uh, been off ill so first day back today which is nerve wracking so bear with me but um, also a lovely first day to come back to um, so yes so I'll probably forget loads of things um, but I will try my best um, but yeah I'm, it is, uh, it's lovely to be here uh, so thank you very much um, so I do hope that I'll share in my uh, doctoral uh, thesis I hope some of the findings resonate with uh, with you um, and I hope I also do the participants justice um, as well. Um, so my study explored the experiences of patients and students uh, and their time they share together on personality disorder units uh, and secure services. Um, that's the lovely long title that often uh, there but essentially it's about what are people's experiences of the time that they, um, they share together. Um, so I've used the term patients because that's the term that the participants um, use themselves. Uh, and it was a, a hermeneutic study, so it's all about the in-depth, raw experiences of people and my interpretation uh, of them. So in true hermeneutic phenomenological style, I've shared a little bit about my kind of feelings now, uh, but I want to share a little bit more, more about uh, myself and uh, my entrance into doing the study. So these are some lovely pictures of some of my foregroundings, which is a Heideggerian term. So Heidegger was the founder of uh, hermeneutic ph uh, phenomenology um, and uh, he talks about foregroundings, where you've come from and, uh, and where you are now um, and these are some pictures that kind of represent uh, those. So uh, certainly uh, the question of doing a study uh, has to come from somewhere um, which is why interpretivism is the um, appropriate paradigm because uh, we cannot forego our experiences um, and where we uh, have come to. So, I am a nurse, a mental health nurse, I've worked and supported people with a personality disorder diagnosis. I've been a student, I've supported students uh, and taught students as well uh, as a lecturer. I did uh, my master's study, again supervised by the wonderful Karen, <laughs> um, and uh, that's a, a link to the article which um, I'm guessing the presentations will get shared as well. If that's okay with you, yeah, yeah, yeah Gary also. So I can I can send them out on um, the, the slides. Oh, I can send them out on the mailing list. Um, so it um, developed on um, the uh, doctoral thesis from the master's study. So mine went off before as well. <laughs> so mine was the first over it. Um, so yeah, it developed on from my um, my master's study, and I really wanted to go back to the things themselves and not look at the therapeutic relationship, which um, is a term that um, gets used a lot, but focus on the time that's shared. And actually that was a really good thing because only two of the patients I interviewed used that term. Um, so I really wanted to go back to them and uh, themselves um, and also not focus on um, diagnosis. It was in a unit where um, people were being supported with that diagnosis, but um, I wasn't identifying that. Um, and also um, sort of extra parts of um, my uh, coming into the study, you'll see pictures here from my lovely um, students and colleagues, um, and also family and friends, which are really important when you're doing any doctoral uh, thesis, any study uh, in general, um, to get support. Um, and I had really wonderful support from supervisors, family, friends, and colleagues. My acknowledgements on my thesis was very long. Lots of people to thank, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and something that happened as part of. Um, through my study was I had a little boy you'll see there with a little Grogu hat on if anyone likes Mandalorian. Yes, and I'm seeing some nod. Um, and, uh, and that really um, enhanced my focus on wanting to do my study. Um, also enhanced a lot of sleep deprivation as well. Thank you, uh, Arthur. Um, uh, and also you'll see um, a link uh, there to my um, uh, interpretive review article so uh, from 
Right. Reading was finding that there was a gap in the evidence base, exploring the time that students and patients share together on um, these uh, units. So it was built on my um, main interests um, and it was really important through doing the hermeneutic study to reflect and dwell. So you'll see there, that is me in Blackpool Sea over Christmas with a Christmas pudding hat on. I so. was going to ask you, <laughs> I was intrigued as to whether that was a true photo. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, so swimming and running um, were really important as part of me reflecting, dwelling, um, doing my analysis uh, as part of the study, which is really crucial part of doing hermeneutic phenomenological studies because it's about interpretation and gaining deep insights and understanding uh, of the participants' experiences. Um, so during my journey and doing the um, study, I really resonated with uh, hermeneutic phenomenology. And Heidegger was the, um, the founder of that. His uh, wonderful book there, I would not mec recommend uh, jumping in and reading that at uh, night time reading. <laughs> Lindsay's laughing her head off over the back there. <laughs> um, very uh, complex and quite hard to um, get your head around, which is why it was really important. I read, read and read and read um, and reread, just like Dory did, and I was also just keep swimming, just keep swimming, as well as just keeping reading to try and understand um, uh, hermeneutic phenomenology. Um, and it um, was wonderful, I think, that, and it, was, it felt really uh, at home when I was um, reading around hermeneutics, because I think there's a really close alignment with mental health, because it's about people's experiences, where people have come from, their experiences into the world and trying to make sense of those um, things, so it really aligned um, really well. Um, and also, as much as it was wonderful, and I loved it, that it was very perplexing, uh, which is a state that Heidegger wanted, because then you question, and you keep questioning, uh, which is what he, uh, he wanted um, to do. And I, although it was very difficult, um, I had great um, supervisors, um, and also reading some of these books, and Dreyfus Herbert, uh, Herbert Dreyfus, uh, is amazing if anyone is interested. So if anyone is um, at the point of doing any study and struggling, <coughs> you, uh, you have times when you feel very stupid and you can't do it, but then also times where you just have this deep connection and it is really worth it. So if anyone is on that journey, um, you're in the hermeneutic circle, as, uh, as uh, Heidegger and Gadamer would say, um, and enjoy it. Um, and it's uh, a lovely experience. Okay, so my <coughs> aim of the study was to um, illuminate patients and students' experiences at the time that they share together. Uh, and I applied through NHS ethics, um, which was an experience, <laughs> um, uh, but a good learning curve. Um, so I interviewed seven patients and five student uh, nurses in individual interviews. And it was important through ethics to be mindful that the patients were in a secure, a medium secure setting. Um, and they needed additional support, but also not to forget the students um, as well in that. Um, uh, so I uh, interviewed um, uh, them, and um, it was Oliver, Mike, and Jasper. They spoke of each other, um, and Oliver was on placement at the time uh, with Jasper and Mike, but the others either weren't on placement or didn't specifically talk about each other. So you'll see um, here it's a... a the structure, the themes uh, that came up from my, my thesis. I used the terms that the participants used um, as, uh, as themes. And I call them themes loosely because they were used to structure um, my, my findings and structure the thesis. Um, but actually what was really helpful was drawing out my, uh, uh, my finding, which was uh, wonderful advice uh, from very uh, helpful uh, supervisors. Um, so this is a, a, a drawing of um, the, uh, the findings um, to, uh, to illuminate what the, um, the main findings were. And that thing on the face there, if you can see, it's not a crumpet, as someone thought. I think they were hungry <laughs> at one point. It's a sponge, because uh, as Fred said, um, the students were sponges. They were, they were new, they were learning, they were soaking up um, information although it might be that people are wanting refreshments and want some crumpets at the moment. Hands up for crumpets. I haven't ordered any crumpets. Oh, Karen. <laughs> 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 we'll set off a biscuit. 
Um, so the analysis was um, unnerving, um, as I often uh, found, um, but was um, instinctual. And what I found was it was the um, phenomenon that would come out was that we're just people and we have value. Uh, and this was through the time that patients and students shared together. They, in, in their space and time, that they um, had these connections, they had a laugh, they talked about the everyday, they developed those connections over common interests um, and found that they had value. And this was in despite of the landscape of a secure setting, di diagnostic labels, uh, boundaries and, uh, and other staff. Um, so I'm going to uh, read um, a quote from Jasper. Um, so for the, the patients, uh, they found that they were just people when they were spending time with students. They were um, not mental, as Jasper said, they were worth something and they found a new identity. So this is uh, a quote from Jasper and what he said. We're not these big bad mental patients, we're just people. By teaching students when I'm with them, I can get them to see that people with personality disorder are not just malignant time wasters, we're just people that really struggle with our emotions and feel things really strongly and that's not bad. And for students, they could help people and make a difference in sharing time with patients. And they built connections. And this is a quote from Molly, one of the students. One of the patients wrote poetry and one day he asked if he could read me one of his poems. He looked ex excited to share it. We went into the little relaxation room on the ward and he read it. It was about his friend who had taken his own life by taking an overdose. So it was a very personal subject. It felt really good because he chose to share it with me. It means so much when patients open up to you and trust you. I felt very fortunate. So you can see the impact that patients and students had on each other. Um, I'm going to read a, a few more really lovely quotes and there were some lovely experiences um, that the participants um, spoke about and you'll see some, um, some quotes there. So Holly, who's a student, she spoke of feeling like she'd made a difference and this is what she said. I was sat with a patient playing Scrabble. It was lovely, just aiming to help a little bit, even if he forgot in a week. It was nice to help him think about the future and make goals, then seeing him be more positive after we talked. It was nice. And Leo, who's uh, one of their patients, this is a lovely quote from him. I was sat with this student. She was one of the best students we've had. She did things for you if you needed straight away. She'd speak to you and say, come on Leo, let's go for this chat. So I'd be sat there for an hour and a half chatting. She just listened. She had work to do, but she just listened. I miss her. One day she saw it in my face that I wasn't well. She could tell. So she made me a brew and we went for a chat. So I was sat there having a nice cup of tea and we were just chatting. We always used to take the piss out of each other. Excuse my language, sorry. She had me in stitches. I had her in stitches and then everyone else joined in. Then I found out she was leaving and I was wounded. It was sad because I might not see her again, but one day, touch wood, I'll see her somewhere. I'll bump into her and say, what's happening? So he speaks of the um, temporal nature of his time with students, limited but limitless. The value of just sitting, chatting, being with. He also speaks of the wounding of being left, but also of hope for the future. And the students often opened possibilities for him. So as I was reading and making sense of things and reading and rereading and listening and talking through supervision um, and really focusing on the findings and being led by the participants, why pe wise people said about not making things fit, so um, reading around the philosophy of hermeneutics and being advised to draw um, things out as well to try and make sense of things and what I was resonating with. So uh, taking the interpretive leap was very scary uh, and in true uh, and Heidegger style, I made my own word up. You like to do that a lot. Um, so therapeuticness, my uh, new term, <laughs> and that's all about this all-encompassing, humane, holistic approach um, that was there and that the, the students um, had. 
and this was through this time and space that the students and, and the patients shared was where they developed this bubble and that was through having a laugh connecting over common uh, common interests um, and having this shared recognition of, and that we're just people and we are valued um, and this um, was in like despite of pe people's experience of thrownness into the world and their often traumatic experiences for um, the patients and students experience this balance so um, Heidi um, talked about leaping ahead which is about empowerment and certainly that's what was experienced in this bubble and the students had this balance between uh, leaping ahead and um, leaping in and leaping in is about taking power away and control um, and the students experienced this and often what I found was when students were enculturated and they became part of the workforce and part of the one as Heidegger would say um, that they became holder of keys these like, physical but symbolic um, uh, example of power uh, and in that landscape there was this pivotal panoptical um, um, panopticon of the office and it sucked the um, staff in and blew this bubble away and blew the service users away and the students were immune to this vacuum of the staff office because they were focusing on empowerment leaping ahead and focusing on being with and connecting um, rather uh, than um, paperwork in the office as the participants talked about. Uh, now they can weather the ride the staff even being part of the one, they can weather the ride um, and by focusing on being with uh, and the mundane every day. So some key recommendations. Um, so students should be on all placements, all the time, wherever possible, uh, really focusing on the mundane every day um, and really being supported to develop um, hobbies so they can build their common interests and use them to, be, uh, to connect and talk um, with, um, with patients. Um, and certainly further research around having a laugh um, and the use of humour within secure services when you're supporting people who may have a diagnosis of personality disorder and um, students use of humour um, further research on, uh, on that and also exploring um, patient roles so something that came out a lot was around sh this patients helping students settle in and teaching students that made them feel of value uh, and worth something is what, what they um, described um, so really exploring the opportunities to do that. So I'm just going to read some things. So this study is a call to all to foster the mundane, the everyday, and recognise the humanity in others. Student nurses, you can balance therapeuticness and professionalism. Be yourselves, have a laugh with patients, connect with them over shared interests, and make bubbles. This study is also a message of hope for patients residing in often dehumanising settings, such as secure units who may have experienced thrownness into the world and traumatic experiences and labels that you can experience humanity, you have worth and value. To students, the time you share is powerful, beautiful and a gift to patients. The impact you can have is immeasurable. To patients, the time you share is beautiful, powerful and a gift to students. So I've experienced moments of euphoria and excitement that I'm going to treasure and then also Lots of confusion, complete confusion um, and exhaustion, mainly because of Arthur, um, which I will also deeply treasure. And, and as Liz Smythe writes, perhaps one becomes wise, yet paradoxically one is left feeling humble. So I am just going to finish our quote <laughs> in true hermeneutic style. <laughs> so when Fred particularly was sharing time with students, um, he spoke a lot about teaching them. And this is what he said. I don't think there's a patient here that's never been told in their life as a youngster, you're useless. I mean, you can't do anything. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have personality disorders if we, got, if we never got all the wee things happen or done to us as kids. To actually step back and actually, you know what? You might have been useless, but you're damn well not useless now. So as healthcare staff, students, patients, carers, teachers, and humans, Go and create some bubbles. That's Arthur, my little boy. He absolutely loves bubbles. Thank you so much.
very cute, and I feel like I've lived this study. <laughs> you have. <laughs> <laughs> but probably not the sweetest nurse. Maybe. Yeah. Thank you so much. So thank you ever so much. We have got some time now. I'm sure there's lots of people that will want to ask questions. So who would like to start with a question for Emma? Can I start? So thank you, Emma. Um, my clinical background is working with men who have had sort of high school settings. So I'm very interested in the you know, things you're talking about. And in terms of students, and again, from experience of supporting students, because it's super new, we've got that additional yes. time yeah, that to make be. connections. And frequently, I used to work on the mission board, so frequently, with, I was about to say we'd meet students. We'd get students on placement, and rather than go through all the negative side of things and all the potential risk side of the case, go and spend some time with the patient to make yes. those connections, build those bubbles in, in your technology. But when does it change? So if a student qualifies, becomes a staff member, yeah. and what you're talking about holding the power, holding the keys in yeah. terms of power, there's not all staff, but there's a yeah. percentage of staff who switch, but being a student, we've been really positive, mm -hmm. and, and done all what you're talking about, which is great, but then there's a switch there. So in terms of your recommendations and future research, I suppose the question is, do you think there should be some research out there, or something there, to support or educate qualified nursing staff to be able to have the time or support or whatever it is to make those connections and build those books. Because you mentioned paperwork and it, the pressure's changed, do not it? So it's a bit, so I don't know if it's the right kind of question, it's probably more of a comment. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Yeah, I know it's a really good comment on, on, on uh, question. Yeah, but it's interesting you said about the supernumerary because that came up. Um, so the patients particularly said about that the students spend more quality time. So even though they're there for maybe a shorter time on placement, they feel like they spend more quality time with them as compared to nurses or healthcare support workers. And what came up from the students and the patients was that it was about roles. So like you said, this change from being a student where you are supernumerary to then a qualified member of staff where you are holding the, the keys and you have these additional roles and responsibilities. So it wasn't necessarily like the negative comparisons, it was comparisons about the changes in role which happened. Um, and I suppose recommendations for how you try and make it so staff can weather the ride, which is a quote from David that said that well, so some staff can weather the ride. So dis despite um, their additional paperwork and the role changes and the identity um, shift, that you can weather the ride by focusing on being with and the, the mundane. Um, but absolutely, just like you said, paper paperwork particularly takes away from that, and it does, and you know, I think take. Um, a lot to, to really focus that on there uh, and you know things like supervision reflective practice um, and, uh, and focusing on the patient and the person <coughs> is really important yeah but yeah certainly and uh, the research say it's very difficult so often yeah. there's a, a quote from an article about nurses being too busy to talk yeah which came up a lot um, uh, in this, yeah. Thank you. yeah do you want to that yeah <laughs> answer the question or yeah. if you had anything further <laughs> Well, I thought, well, I'll tell you what, let's do Jim, then Tarina, then Julie, and then there'll probably, that's what we've got time for. But there'll be time as well later on, you've got your own. My thought is about potassium. Potassium? Yeah, design. Design, yeah. yeah. And I, Heidegger's made up words. And I, actually, I wanted you to tell me about design, design today, because that really struck me and made me think of Ish, you know, by London, that sort of be present, choose your attitude, have some fun. <laughs> you know, it's very much like that. But well, can you just explain acid to me a little bit? Yeah, uh, so um, design is um, one of Heidegger's main terms he uh, uses. He um, is a German philosopher, so. I'll write it on, I'll write it on the Thanks, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Always with a whiteboard pen, you can't, no, you can't no. take the teacher away from um, And then um, it was what's very tricky with um, doing hermeneutic phenology is. Um, Heidegger and Gadamer were German philosophers, so that Heidegger found that there wasn't a terminology to describe what he was trying to describe and talk about. So instead of using human being, which had connotations to it and, 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 and previous understanding of what that word is, he used the term Dasein, which means being there. Um, so that might be to uh, what you're saying there about being, being present, being there. Um, and. Uh, and what's tricky is the translation from then German philosophy and very dense text to English um, uh, is, is, uh, is quite tricky. But yeah, it's essentially being there and, um, and 
uh, you know, being a, uh, be a, a human being. And part of being Darzai is we are always being with others, which was really important within this study, um, and being with, and it's all a matter of care. So he used the term solitude, solitude. Um, and, it, and that's where leaping in and leaping head is, because it's always a matter of care for others that we're either leaping ahead and trying to empower or leaping in and taking control away which is certainly what we do a lot in um, in healthcare. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Often, um, and it's within um, the uh, evidence base about the often very negative attitudes towards services and towards patients who have a diagnosis or thought to have a diagnosis of personality disorder, um, which is a very, um, as quoted uh, by, by Ty Peter Tyre, a very flawed diagnosis um, that is often questioned, um, and the attitudes that are um, very much associated um, uh, uh, yeah, with that. Um, and what was the first, first bit you said? I knew I should have written it down. No, 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 the student, did it make them think this is an area, this is a patient group that I would like to work with in the future, um, rather yes. than dismiss it from the Thank you, yeah. We need more people like that. Yeah, um, yeah so they, um, there was yeah, two, two bits. There was the, the, pa the participants talked about often having their judgment clouded and that was something that came up in the mass the master's study uh, thesis was that often students can feel like talking to other staff can cloud their judgment of working with people with that diagnosis but actually in this study the students talked about that they these experiences uh, experiences with the patients made them want to come to placement and they felt like they were were something and they had made a difference um, and built these connections and it actually made them want to work within that um, area and there was one of them who got a job on the placement area where she was because she'd really enjoyed it and then another student who spoke <coughs> about how she absolutely loved her placement as well. <laughs> Sorry, my, my uh, memory's not great of questions so thank you. This is why I need a pen and paper. <laughs> Well, and then my question, I suppose, is related to the fact that we're both practice module leaders. Um, <laughs> yeah. <in the> <laughs> program. Uh, and obviously thinking about you know, the structure of our human rights and health nursing and our PAR document and the mm -hmm. very heavy focus towards more um, physical health and adult nursing aspects. Have you had any ideas of how we can perhaps incorporate some of this you know, therapeuticness into <laughs> <laughs> our practice modules to get students? really appreciate the value of just talking and engaging, yeah. you know, students quite often will say, you know, it's not a very busy placement, you know, I've not had lots <laughs> to do, and you, you find yourself, you talk That's good, yeah. you just talk, um, so I'm just wondering if it's led you to kind of think of how we can you know, bring some of that into mm. you know, our students. Yes, yeah, oh, okay. thanks to you. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think you know, um, we can do a lot. Maybe we, we call uh, the modules therapeuticness modules or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's like you say, focusing on that, just being with and just being sat with someone, which is really difficult to measure or, or put into a, a, a PAR document, the um, placement assessment documents. Um, and actually, something that a few colleagues, Michael as well, is sat there. Um, so myself, um, Chris Connell, Mike um, Haslam. Jane Christone, Christine and Jill. Yeah, um, we've all recently written an article about um, the importance of mental health nursing identity and focusing on therapeutic this basically and how um, the, the pair documents are often very uh, measurable task focused things and the students in my study said that it felt like their competencies on placement were tick box exercises um, and 
and certainly that's something that we've um, we've written about and it's being investigated further actually within mental health academics um, to uh, to really keep that mental health nursing identity and focus on the mundane every day which isn't mundane at all and isn't basic it's the being with and connecting and making bubbles um, and that is very tricky for how you then put that into modules and how, and, and how do you do that in a, in a classroom so I don't know if there's an actual answer or <laughs> something to think <laughs> to coming into those modules Yay. Um, <laughs> so oh we should think about it shouldn't we yeah. maybe we should just have a room and just have and it, somebody talk about having a nice cup of tea it doesn't have to be tea um, it can be anything because I don't drink tea <coughs> but it's nice just having a drink sat with somebody maybe we just spend two hours doing that <laughs> and talking about common stuff interests so thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. It's good. Do you know it's finished? It's just